Hello everybody, it's the War Hipster here, coming at you with another Battle Tone review video. And today we are of course looking at the biggest, the bestest, the mightiest, the rightiest army in all of Age of Sigma. We are taking a look at the Sons of Bayamat. We have their third edition codex. It's really awesome! They are large and definitely in charge as they stomp their way into 3rd edition Age of Sigma. But they don't just bring a new book, no. They bring a brand new model as well. Well, not really a brand new model. He's an upgrade sprue in the original Mega Gargant box. But that aside, we have King Brod, who is just gorgeous to look at. Here he is. Can I just take a quick second of your time? How awesome is it that a model as epic as the Mega Gargant can have add-on sprues? Add-on sprues. See, all it does is it just subtly changes little things about this main base kit, but it looks so good. How do they do this? I mean, the legs are all the same in all of them. It's just one base set of legs and body. It's just a simple head change and a couple of weapons here or there and the odd trinket and the odd face. But it all always just clicks together so nicely. I love this. I mean, sure, knights. You just whack an extra gun in there and maybe a faceplate or something. But these, it's genuinely very, very, very impressive. And if you agree and you want to see something that is almost as impressive as Games Workshop's model design team, why not click the subscribe button and turn on notifications? That way, you'll be notified when the painting tutorial for King Brod goes live later on today. You know I filmed it. Come on now. And just before we get underway, a massive, massive thank you to Games Workshop for sending me Sons of Bayamat and King Brod early to review for all of you. This has been a, a real exciting week, I have to tell you. Now we have little time and lots of stuff to get through, so sit back and relax as it's time for a history lesson before we look to the future of the Sons of Bayamat. The earth shakes, the land cracks, beasts flee en masse from the dust clouds on the horizon and the ears of mortals are filled with bellowing roars that grow ever more deafening. There is only one explanation. The sons of Behemoth are coming. In all the realms, few creatures are more terrifying than these gargants. The smallest are as tall as a Sigmarite temple, while the largest are almost too huge for the mind to process. Titanic slabs of muscle, hunger and battle lust. They go where they please, fight what they choose, kill and loot whenever they desire, and they dare anyone to tell them they can't. To a Gargant, strength alone defines one's place within the cosmos and they have strength in abundance. Their fists are powerful enough to smash fortress walls and their feet can kick a raging dragon into submission. What they can do to those smaller creatures caught in their trampling path is best left unconsidered. Ever since the death of Behemoth the World Titan, the legendary god-beast ancestor of the Gargant race, a strange, brutal animus has overcome these creatures with every passing season. The strongest titans grow larger and larger, their power swelling as never before and serving to draw their lesser kin to their side. But who was Behemoth? As the Gargants tell it, Behemoth grew from a stone that had been swallowed by Yimnog, Yimnog is the grandfather of the Gargants and was a truly titanic godbeast of mind-boggling proportions. He drank fully half of the first ocean and cracked a stretch of Gur to such an extent that it would forever be known as Yimnog's Trample. A figure of awe and terror even to Gargants, eventually he settled down to sleep and it was then that Behemat and his brothers, yes, there were more than one mega-titanic mega-super-giant guy Gant god beasts brewed up a vast lake of foul disgusting moonshine in Imnog's stomach so foul that even the grandfather of Gargants would be forced to vomit up his stomach contents and this 
Behemat, Gorg, and Amagorag could escape. The other two succumbed to the vapours of the moonshine and ended up brawling with each other whilst Behemat made his escape. Behemat wasn't quick enough though and Imnog's mouth closed and it was then that Behemat began to hammer away at Imnog's teeth and eventually the splintered teeth of Imnog would form the first mountains of the realms. At least that's how the Gargants tell it from time to time. What we do know of Behemat is that he was a carefree soul that roamed the mortal realms and did as he pleased when he pleased. He had the life that Gorka Morka craved instead of being beholden to Sigmar's pantheon of up-jumped mortal godlings. Gorka Morka was oath-bound to Sigmar's pantheon however, but he longed for the freedom to unleash the joys of destruction on the mortal realms. Instead, he couldn't, at least for now. Gorkamorka spent the early days of the Age of Myth challenging Behemat to ever greater feats of strength, ones that Gorkamorka knew Behemat's pride wouldn't allow him to turn down. As an example, one story that is told by the Gargants of Behemat is as follows. After Gorkamorka slew a nest of rampaging Gigadroths, he challenged Behemat to block the supervolcano known as Volcatrix's lair from which the creatures emerged. The World Titan accomplished this by ripping the top off Mount Krolosid and using it to plug the volcano's caldera. When a horde of angry Dwardens spilled out from the mountain, Behemat stomped them so flat that even their descendants have not recovered their former stature. Behemat was a real creature, but many of the stories could be considered fact or just the Gargant's way of explaining the world around them. They use the legends of Behemat to contextualize the mortal realms, so whilst it probably did happen. Behemat is not the reason Dwarden are short, but he could be. Maybe? Behemat eventually was challenged by Gorka Morka to defeat Sigmar himself in combat, something that Gorka Morka had never been able to do, but still he challenged Behemat. Behemat gladly took on the challenge, so began to roam about Gyron, trampling cities and bellowing insults to Sigmar, and thus he could not be ignored. Sigmar and Behemat battled amidst the great storm of Verdia, and whilst their contest was legendary, with some saying that the spilt blood formed the waterfalls of the surrounding mountains, Behemat, the mightiest and rightiest of all, was laid low, for none could best the Lord of the Tempest. Sigmar struck him a blow to the chin that could have cracked open the realms, but Behemat wasn't slain, he was merely knocked unconscious for a millennia. He was not awake to see the end of the Age of Myth and the beginnings of the Age of Chaos. The Age of Chaos was a terrible and dark time for the realms, as one could expect from something called the Age of Chaos. The Gargants, whilst unfazed by things like blood gods and whatnot, were not unaffected by the times. Many Gargants were overrun and slain by the endless demonic legions spilling forth across the realms. Some simply joined in with the followers of Chaos and helped in the destruction of many mortal civilizations, and others tried to stay out of the way, or at least ahead of the slaughter and darkness enveloping the realms. They have no concept of the spiritual danger the demons and the ruinous powers posed, but they did recognize the corruption and defilement of nature and the realms themselves, and were none too pleased with how things were going. Meanwhile, Archaon, recognising the power of the Gargants and Behemat himself, planned to awaken, corrupt, and use the god beast to smash down the gates of Azir that Sigmar had slammed shut when he abandoned the realms to the predations of Chaos. A long plot to do just that was on the precipice of becoming a reality when the Stormcast Eternals arrived in the mortal realms. The Stormcasts attacked the Scabrous Sprawl, where Behemat slept, to undo the machinations of Archaon. Recognising what they were attempting to do, King Brod himself led the Gargants of Gyron to assist the Stormcast Eternals in the fight against Chaos, and at the climax of the battle, the ground shook and split, and the immense form of Behemat began to rise at long last. And then, the Celestant Prime, wielding the spears of divine lightning known as the Twelve Great Bolts, murdered Behemat, or slew him. It depends on your outlook on such things, I suppose. And that was the end of Behemat. But his sons were numerous still, and they were really, really, really mad. 
Eventually, they got a battle tome in Age of Sigmar 2nd Edition, and the Mega Gargans made their first appearance in the Mortal Realms, at least on the tabletops of the world. And now they are an army that you can use to murder those golden pipsqueaks and any other trifling mortals in the Age of Sigmar, and boy, can you murder real good with the Sons of Bayamat. Oh boy! Now we know they're already very, very good, as this graphic that was shared yesterday tells us. But how do they stack up in 3rd edition? Let's take a look. As per usual, each Age of Sigmar army has allegiance abilities, and these contain battle traits, enhancements, which are command traits and artifacts of power, and various other different things. The first place to look is the battle traits, and we have three here. We have Mightier Makes Rightier, Lord and Master, and Wrath of Titans. The Mightier Makes Rightier battle trait is a really cool mechanic that lets you hold objectives. Each Mega Gargant has a Mightier Makes Rightier value listed on its damage table on its war scroll. For the purposes of contesting objectives, each Mega Gargant model in a Sons of Bayamat army counts as a number of models equal to its Mightier Makes Rightier value, while each Man Crusher Gargant counts as 10 models. This can make it a little complicated to try and take objectives from the Mega Gargants. You'll want to fortify your positions, otherwise you're in trouble. Lord and Master. This is how you build your Sons of Bayamat armies. First, you must decide whether your Sons of Bayamat army will be a Taker Tribe, a Breaker Tribe, a Smasher Tribe, or a Stomper Tribe. The type you pick dictates the general of your army as follows. A Taker Tribe, your general must be a Kraken Eater. A Breaker Tribe, your general must be a Gatebreaker. A Smasher Tribe, your general must be a Beast Smasher. And a Stomper Tribe, your general must be a War Stomper. Additional allegiance abilities are available to each type of Sons of Bayamat army on pages 64 to 67, which we will get to very, very shortly. The Wrath of Titans. When you carry out a monstrous rampage with a friendly Mega Gargant, you can carry out one of the monstrous rampages below instead of any other monstrous rampage you can carry out with that unit. So you have your generic ones, but you also get some specifics. You get Beast Grapple, which lets you pick one enemy monster within three inches of this unit and roll a dice, and on a three plus until the end of the following combat phase, the Strike Last effect applies to both that monster and the unit carrying out this monstrous rampage. This is very, very cool, especially if you're taking a mercenary Mega Gargan day. Eh? Earth Shaking Roar. Pick one enemy unit with a wounds characteristic of one or two within three inches of this unit and roll 2d6. If the roll is higher than that unit's bravery characteristic, for each point by which the roll exceeds the unit's bravery characteristic, one model in that unit flees. That unit's commanding player decides which models flee, and this effect of this monstrous rampage is not considered to be a battle shock test. So, it affects anyone, even those who are afraid, or unafraid, of battle shock. Colossal Slam. Pick one enemy monster that is not part of a unit consisting of two or more models, and that is within one half inch of this unit. Roll a dice. On a 3+, plus, you can remove that monster from the battlefield and set it up again anywhere wholly on open ground within half an inch of this unit. That monster suffers D3 mortal wounds. In addition, subtract one from hit rolls for attacks made by the unit carrying out this monstrous rampage until the end of the following combat phase. This is just fantastic for just moving monsters out of the way if they're blocking off an objective or a corridor or the rest of your opponent's army. I absolutely adore this. I think it's fantastic. Moving on to the enhancements then. We have the command traits. Now you get three generic ones, so any one of your Mega Gargants can take this if they choose. And my favourite one here is Monstrously Tough. This general has a wounds characteristic of 40 instead of 35, which is just fantastic. Another honourable mention is the Rabble Rouser, which adds one to charge rolls for friendly Sons of Bayamat units wholly within 18 inches of this general, and Furious Temper is pretty cool, letting you act as if your general is at the top of their damage table once per battle. Moving on to the Titanic Trophies, again, you have four generic ones here. My favourite one is Calloused Feet, or Extra Calloused Feet, 
which are model armed with an almighty stomp only. The bearer's almighty stomp has an attacks characteristic of 3 instead of 2, a rend characteristic of minus 3 instead of minus 2, and a damage characteristic of 3 instead of d3. This is just very, very, very fun. The glowy shield of protectiness is pretty cool, changing a rend characteristic of minus 1 to dash. In addition, if the unmodified save roll for an attack made with a melee weapon that targets the bearer is 6, the attacking unit suffers one mortal wound after all of its attacks have been resolved, which is nice. And the Amber Bone Totem, which allows the bearer to a charge, even if they ran in the same turn. Very, very, very cool. Then you have the four tribes, and each one has additional battle traits, enhancements, and artifacts. What you'll notice is that each of them gears you towards using Man Crusher Gargans as the battle traits almost all benefit the Man Crushers, and the enhancements and that are of course geared towards your general, who will be one of the four variants of Mega Gargans. As you must select one to be your general in order to take a legitimate Sons of Bayamat army. King Brod does not have any of them as a keyword, so he can't, for example, be the general of a Taker tribe. He's just joining them for the Bants. Now, whilst we're not going to read all of them, as they are all quite lengthy, as they all get battle traits, command traits, and artifacts of power, we are going to look at my favourite, and that is the Taker tribe. This is a tribe led by a Kraken Eater Mega Gargan, and it is as follows. The battle traits are, Get rid of them! And, I want that for me collection. Get rid of them! For the purposes of contesting objectives, each friendly Man Crusher Gargant model counts as 15 models instead of 10. In addition, add 5 to the mightier makes rightier value for friendly Kraken Eaters that are contesting an objective. This makes it very, very hard to take them off them. And I want that for me collection. You can use this command ability at the start of the combat phase. The command can only be issued by your general, and the unit that receives the command must be a friendly Man Crusher Gargan. Until the end of that phase, add one to the damage characteristic of attacks made with melee weapons that target an enemy unit that bears an artifact of power or is unique. Very useful for going after named characters, named monsters, any kind of generals or tech pieces that your opponent might have. Very useful. You have a choice of two command traits here, and that goes for the same for the rest of them as well. The two command traits here are very acquisitive and extremely intimidating. If you give an artifact of power to this general, you can pick one additional artifact of power and give it to them as well. This general can have two artifacts of power, and both artifacts of power must be different. Now that's very, very good. <laughs> very, very good indeed. Extremely intimidating is pretty good as well. Enemy units within six inches of this general cannot receive the inspiring presence or rally commands, which really does mess with some of those lower bravery, but also your opponent's strategies for coping with your army. Lastly, like all of them, you get two artifacts of power. The Wallopin Tentacle is a Kraken Eater only, and at the start of the combat phase you can pick one enemy hero within three inches of the bearer and roll a dice. On a 4+, that hero suffers D3 mortal wounds, and the strike last effect applies to that hero until the end of that phase. Which is okay, it's fine. The glowy lantern, however, is pretty fun, because it turns your gargant into a wizard. You can cast one spell that summons an endless spell in the same manner as a wizard. When they do so, the range of that spell is doubled. Which is just really fun. It's particularly useful as well in these armies because you often have quite an awkward number of points left over when you're building your Mega Gargants and your Sons of Bayamat army, so being able to fill out that last little bit of points with an endless spell is just pretty useful. Now the others all do different things, for example the Smasher tribe wants to smash monsters, the Stomper tribe wants to get stuck in with everyone at the same time, and the Breaker tribe wants to run dead quick with 3d6 charges and they want to squish heroes, totems and monsters to varying degrees. They're all very good and they all do different things, and they all do what they want to do very very well. The strength of this battle tome is in the War Scrolls. All the grand strategies, however, before we get to the War Scrolls, are brilliant, and some are maybe a little too easy. Make the land tremble, for example. When the battle ends, you complete this grand strategy if any friendly units ran or made a charge move in every battle round. It does not have to be the same unit that runs or makes a charge move in every battle round. The battle tactics, on the other hand, are interesting. 
as there's six of them. However, four of them are designed to be done by the corresponding tribe of Gargans. That's mine involves kicking objectives, so the Kraken Eater does that. Man Skittles has the War Stomper keyword in it and everything, for example. So grand strategies are fairly easy, but the battle tactics are a little tougher, or at least your selection is narrower in this book. The Gore Battalions are great, both giving you a one drop, and you are definitely going to fill these if not both of them. So you might as well take one of each, or you, you just absolutely will be using the Gore Battalions. Mercenary Mega Gargants are still a thing, with each Grand Alliance able to hire a particular Mega Gargant. Destruction can hire a Beast Smasher, Order can hire a Kraken Eater, Chaos or Destruction can hire a War Stomper, and finally, Death or Destruction can hire a Gatebreaker. They each have a Mercenary ability. And now, once again, my favourite does go to the Kraken Eater here, or Bundo Whalebiter as he's commonly known. He can give himself Strike Last, but if he does that, he adds one to hit and wound rolls, which if you time it right, and he's not in too much danger, is really rather vicious. Next up, we have War Scrolls, and there's eight in total. Man, that's refreshing. They're also all battle line. So in 2000 points, you'll need four units, but four units minimum. Now, we have two new players, and one that is a new player, but not really. Kragnos is in this new Kragnos is in this book because of course he is. He's the god of earthquakes. Why would he want to be left out of the earthquakiest army? We're not going to dive into his war scroll because it's the same as it's been in the Auric War Clans book as far as I can tell, but he will be on the screen a bit because while well, I don't yet have a Sons of Bayamat army to make this bit visually interesting yet. So King Brod King Brod has a truly exceptional stat line, at least to my mortal eyes. He has 40 wounds. He has a degradable move that goes from 10 inches down to 8 inches at his worst level. He has a 4 plus save and a bravery characteristic of 9. His melee weapons include the Obelisk of Torcrania, the Almighty Stomp and the Death Grip. Now the Almighty Stomp and Death Grip both have extra rules which you can see down below which we'll get to in a second, but the Obelisk of Torcrania is a 3 inch range, it has a degradable amount of attacks from 4 to 2, hits on 3+, plus, wounds on 3+, plus, has a minus 2 rend and damage 5. <laughs> oh my. He has a number of things on his damage table. They are the Obelisk of Torcrania's attacks, of course, a Creeper's roll, and his Mightier makes Rightier value. It goes from 25 to 15, which is just very, very good. And now we're going to get into his War Scroll abilities. He is a War Master, so he can be included in a Sons of Bayamat army and is treated as a general, even if it's not the model picked to be the army's general. Now, you're not going to have many armies that are led by King Brod because he doesn't have any of the keywords and he isn't one of the four Gargants that can lead a tribe. So you'll be taking one of the unnamed Gargants as your Warlord or General and King Brod will be coming along just to have some fun. Now the Almighty Stomp being the two attacks, three plus, three plus, minus two, D3 damage. If you add one to hit rolls for attacks made with this unit's Almighty Stomp that target an enemy unit with a wounds characteristic of three or less. So very, very good for fighting infantry. The Creepers, which has a degrading roll from 2 plus to 5 plus, in each charge phase, the first time an enemy monster within 3 inches of this unit is picked to carry out a monstrous rampage, roll a dice. If the roll is equal to or greater than the Creepers value shown on this unit's damage table, that monster cannot carry out a monstrous rampage. The Crushing Charge. After this unit makes a charge move, roll a dice for each enemy unit within 1 inches of this unit. On a 2+, plus, that unit suffers D3 mortal wounds if it is a monster, or D6 mortal wounds if it is not a monster. The Death Grip, being one of his melee weapons, is a 3-inch range again. He has a 1 attack with it, it hits on 3s, wounds on 2s, has a minus 2 rend, and damage D6. When determining the damage inflicted by an attack made with this unit's Death Grip that targets an enemy monster, you can roll 2 dice instead of 1, and pick either result. Long Shanks. When this unit makes a normal move, runs or retreats, it can pass across other models that are not monsters and parts of terrain features that are less than 4 inches tall in the same manner as a unit that can fly, because he's massive. As a son of Bayamat, 
he cannot be affected by any spells or abilities that would slay the model without any wounds or mortal wounds being caused. Instead, he just suffers d6 mortal wounds, so no automatically removing the Mega Gargant. With Terror, enemy units cannot receive the Inspiring Presence command while they're within 3 inches of any friendly units with this ability. And with Timber, if this model is slain, before moving the model from the battlefield, the players must roll off. The winner picks a point on the battlefield 5 inches from the slain model. Each unit within 3 inches of that point that is not a Mega Gargant suffers D3 mortal wounds. The slain model is then removed from the battlefield as he crushes everything by falling on it. <laughs> now King Brod is a priest and he gets to invoke the power of Bayamat. It is a prayer that has an answer value of 3 and adds 1 to the chanting roll if an enemy monster has been slain by this unit in this battle. If answered, pick one of the effects below. The same effect cannot be picked more than once per battle. Shatter the Mountains. Add 2 inches to the move characteristic of friendly Sons of Bayamat units until the end of the turn. Might of the Earth. You can heal up to D3 wounds allocated to each friendly Sons of Bayamat unit. Pummel all to dust. Improve the rend characteristic of the following melee weapons used by our friendly Sons of Bayamat units by 1 until the end of the turn. The Obelisk of Torcrania, Menia Club, the Shipwrecker War Club, the Titanic Boulder Club, the Fort Crusher Flail, and the Massive Club. All in all, King Brod is an absolute fantastic character to add to your army. I think in the general terms of taking two, maybe three Mega Gargants, you're seriously missing out if you don't have King Brod in your Sons of Bayamat army now. As for the rest of the four Mega Gargants, all do a variation on the same thing in terms of their stat line. They all move 10 inches at their top profile, have 35 wounds, a save of 4+, plus. however, the Beast Smasher is a little braver on Bravery 8 rather than 7. Their Mightier Makes Rightier stat is 20 down to 12 in all cases, and they all have a variation of Almighty Stomp, Death Grip, Son of Bayamat, Terror, Timber and Longshanks. There's a few variations here and there of course like an extra attack on the War Stompers or Mighty Jump as opposed to a Stomp. Their weapons all do varying degrees of attacks and damage and they all have a specific ability or two that is unique to them. The Kraken Eater is once again my favourite because of course it is with the ability to kick objectives which is both tactically sound and hilarious to do. The Man Crushers are your smaller Gargants, and you can take them either as a mob of three or as a single Man Crusher. They're all noted as single as well, so no reinforced units for you. I know you were thinking of a unit of nine Man Crushers, but you just can't do it. They're single and ready to mingle, but not be reinforced. Each Man Crusher has an 8 inch move, 12 wounds, a 5 plus save, and bravery 7. They have missile weapons in the throw-in rocks, which are 18 inch range, 1 attack, 4 plus, 3 plus, minus 1, d3 damage, and they are armed with massive clubs, ed butt, and mighty kick. They put out a ton of damage, as you can see, at varying degrees of rend, with a fair amount of attacks for something of this size. Now, in terms of their war scroll abilities, they have keep up. If this unit is wholly within 15 inches of a friendly Mega Gargant at the start of the charge phase, it can attempt a charge in that charge phase even if it ran in the same turn, which is just very, very nice. Stomping Charge. After this unit makes a charge move, pick one enemy unit within one inch of it and roll a dice. If the roll is equal to or greater than the stomping charge value shown on this unit's damage table, that enemy unit suffers D3 mortal wounds. Stuff them in me bag. After this unit makes a pile-in move, pick one enemy model within 3 inches of it and roll a dice. If the roll is at least double that model's wounds characteristic, it is slain. And finally they have Timber, as opposed to Timber! If this model is slain before removing the model from the battlefield, the players must roll off. The winner picks a point on the battlefield 3 inches from the slain model. Each unit within 2 inches of that point that is not a Gargant or a Mega Gargant suffers D3 mortal wounds and the slain model is then removed from the battlefield. So all in all, they're very good, they're very cool and they're reasonably cheap at 150 points each. So there we have it folks, all done and dusted. But as usual, I do have a list idea that I've been knocking about, so here it is. It's a Taker Tribe. 
no prizes for guessing that. And in this army we have King Brod, we have a Kraken Eater Mega Gargan, and we have two Man Crusher mobs, each consisting of three Man Crushers. This lets me take advantage of both of the War Scroll Battalions, i.e. the Man Crushers and the Mega Gargants, to two drops in total for this army. Now it's a little bit tricky to do a all of it into one. You could take all Mega Gargants, you could take three Man Crusher mobs and a Mega Gargan, but then you would be missing out on King Brod. Essentially, I think this is probably my favorite way to run this and one of the most flexible ways of doing it as well. It's got a bunch of range in it, so everything can throw rocks apart from King Brod and it just goes in, it holds the objectives and it smashes anyone that comes close. Really, it's an ideal Sons of Bayamat army. So there we have it. The littlest book with the biggest heart is now done. I'm not proud of that joke. <laughs> but yes, we're done. Sons of Bayamat all finished. I really love this book. I think it's fantastic. I think it's written really, really well. I think a lot of the kind of naming conventions in here are just some of the best that we've ever seen. And there's a lot of personality in this book. It's just a cracking read. Really, really good fun. I highly recommend picking it up just to read about them. Their stories are amazing, as I alluded to earlier in the video. And, well, you can't really go wrong with having a big, gigantic centerpiece in your army. Depending on which Grand Alliance that you take or are in fascinated with, you could have a Mega Gargan and just go on about your business. But this book, absolutely well worth picking up for the casual and serious fan alike. I think they're very powerful. I think there's a lot of play here in the book. I think maybe they might go straight to the top of the meta, as they already kind of sit there anyway, but we shall see, of course. I really like the interactions between the Mega Gargants and the Man Crushers. They've really kind of dialed into that in this book, which is really cool. You can see a lot more variation, I think, than the you know, gatebreaker spam that you kind of see at the moment. But thank you so much for watching. I hope you enjoyed this one and I'll see you all very, very soon for more Battletone review videos and of course more painting tutorials. Do make sure you are subscribed so you can check out the King Broad video later on. I'm really excited to show that one to all of you. Just an absolutely fantastic model. And that's it. I'll see you all very, very soon. Happy Wargaming. If you enjoyed this video, you love the channel and you want to support me further like these legends and bosses on the screen before you, you can do so. Head to patreon.com forward slash warhipster or head to ko-fi.com forward slash warhipster. Alternatively, you could become a YouTube member by heading to the channel page and clicking on the join button just here, just like these amazing, wonderful people have done. And if you really like this video or you just want to shoot me some support, you can click on the thanks button just below this video. Don't forget to share it, like it, comment on it, and don't forget to subscribe to the channel. And to make sure you stay up to date, don't forget to click the bell icon. Thank you so much for watching, and I'll see you all very soon in the next one. Happy Wargaming.